Welcome to the final session of Race, Justice, Mercy, and Jesus Christ, a biblical worldview conference addressing tough questions with true answers. Our aim over the next hour is to discuss how Christians can love their neighbor and glorify God across ethnic and racial differences, even when prevailing voices in our culture tell us that we're hopelessly and endlessly divided. For this panel discussion, our earlier speakers have returned to the stage. Dr. H.C. Felder, the founder of Giving an Answer and author of The African American Guide to the Bible. Monique Toussaint, the president and co-founder of the Center for Biblical Equality. And Joshua Nelson, a chemistry teacher at Wisconsin Lutheran High School, where he mentors students across the full diversity of American ethnicities. Additionally, a member of the Bethany Lutheran College student body will serve on this discussion panel. Ana Martinez Pacheco, is a senior majoring in legal studies with minors in philosophy and business. She also serves as president of the college's World Club. She grew up in Cuba as Anna, but many of you call her by her Americanized name, Anna. Her family came to America when she was 15, and this past fall she naturalized as a U.S. citizen. My first two questions will be for Anna. After that, I'll pose a few questions for the panel in general, and then you'll have the opportunity to come to the microphone and ask a question of your own. So, Anna, I'll start with a two-part question. First, what is your most treasured memory of growing up in Cuba? And secondly, what do you appreciate most about living in the United States? All right, thanks for those questions, and thank you, everyone, for being here during our last session. So, to answer those questions, first, um, I think one of the things I miss most about Cuba is the church. Um, in the sense that, so my parents were pastors of a church for pretty much my whole childhood and life in Cuba. And it's funny because I feel like many of you guys have been abroad and you know this, but in other countries, it feels like there isn't really a time frame when you go to church, like service can just last forever. And so I kind of miss that because, you know, here we respect time a lot. <laughs> um, and then one thing I love about being here, was that the other question, yeah. Dr. McPherson? Um, this is going to sound very cheesy and, you know, <laughs> kind of cliche, but I love just being in America and like the freedom you have to pretty much do anything. Um, back home, it just felt it just felt like you always had to do things by the book in the sense that, you know, the government and the institutions had to agree with it. And in the U.S., it's more like, well, if you want to go to church, go to church. If you don't, that's okay, too. And so we just have that freedom in many other areas, and I appreciate that about here. Thank you. And you'll graduate in about two months, and you've already uh, been hired to start at that time as a paralegal to assist Mexican-American agricultural workers. But you also have some other longer-term uh, dreams, and that would be to work for some kind of organization that assists refugees in finding safe homes, building stable communities, and learning to trust the Lord more each day. So I'd like to invite you to tell us more about those plans that you have for your future. Sure. So like Dr. McPherson just mentioned, I was just hired to be a paralegal for a nonprofit. Um, they work with agricultural workers in Minnesota and North Dakota, and essentially we provide free legal aid to anyone that qualifies. And so I'm very excited to be part of that program because it's a bilingual program, so I'm going to get to use my Spanish a lot more than I use it at Bethany. So that's definitely nice. Um, and for the future, um, I do hope to go to law school and eventually become an immigration lawyer and work with more immig immigrant communities and people who've probably had similar experiences as me and hopefully I'll be helpful in one way or another. Now, Monique, you have experience working with economically struggling communities as well, and so I, I just wonder what advice or encouragement do you have for Anna as she, continue, as she considers that, that career path that she just described? Well, congratulations on graduating and on your job. That's awesome. Um, I would say advice on, you said working with low-income or low socioeconomic communities? Refugees or in refugees? her case, okay. right, yes. 
Um, I, I think my advice would be the same across the board, no matter what community you're working with, is to remember um, the definition of a human person. Remember how God defines a human and what are the things that can help a human versus, or empower a human versus what are the things that may disempower someone and create a, um, a setup where they may not feel or not even feel where they may not live out the purpose that God has designed them for. So part of that um, and something that I feel like I talk about a lot and Krista talks about a lot is the idea of work. You know, how do, how do we um, work with people so that they can work because work is part of the created order? Um, how do we maintain family and keep family together because we see family being designed in Genesis as part of the created order? And so I know um, from working with a lot of people in the homeless community and um, immigrants in the homeless community and things like that, like sometimes families are split up, sometimes work isn't an option. What can you do to really sow into a person or a family to uphold the biblical mandates of work and family? And just looking at um, how you can enhance or empower someone to live within the, the structure or the design that God has created for human people. Thank you. I was giving this to you. I don't know why. I don't know why. Don't judge me. <laughs> so, so we've been talking a lot today about racism, about racial identity, about ethnicity, some of the challenges that we face here in the United States, both about talking about race and also how do we live in, within and across cultures and communities. So I suppose a quick demographic summary of our panel today would be that we have an African-American male, an African-American female, a, a white male, and a Latina. That's what we've been trained by our culture to see when we look at a discussion panel like the one before us. But we also hear voices in our culture talking about the importance of being colorblind. And so the question I'd like to pose for all four of you to consider now is, is when is it helpful to think in terms of racial or ethnic difference? And when is that just a barrier that gets in the way of truly getting to know one another? I'll take a shot at it. I'm, rem I'm reminded of Acts, what is it, 1726, maybe it's 1726, where God says that he created everyone from one man, that they were all spread out over the earth, and he appointed times and places for them to live. So that tells me that God is actually the author of ethnic diversity. I think God loves ethnic diversity, just like we see it in creation. We see it in the different kind of birds that are out there. We see it in the different kind of uh, uh, cats and all that type of stuff and fish. We see, we see diversity, the different kinds of plants, some of the most colorful plants you can imagine. I mean, you can see them, you can be like, oh, you just, it just screams God's glory. I think God has that same, in, that same thing in mind when, he, when it comes to, to the differences in us, the ethnic diversity in us. I think God likes the fact that we're diverse, that he likes the fact that we are, that we are different from one another. As long as those differences don't cause us to sin, as long as we don't use those differences now to denigrate someone else because of that ethnicity difference. I tend not to use the word racial, because race, race is like my man-made type of thing. So I tend to use the word ethnicities. So I think God praises it. I think God loves it. I think we should, we should celebrate it as long as we're not like belittling someone else or as long as we're not sinning against someone because of their ethnicity. I would say I think it's a both and conversation. So do I want to be colorblind? Yes and no. Um, the, in the way that we treat people, we should treat people without partiality. So to a degree, yes, I don't, I don't want to um, you know, treat Josh white because, uh, Josh differently because he is white. That, isn't, that, that wouldn't be um, participating according to the laws of scripture and what the word says. I think it's like Leviticus 19 and James 2. And yet, if I don't see him physically, like, to me that doesn't even really make sense. Like, physically I can see him because I'm not blind. Now, 
being able to physically see him also helps me to remain alert to things that might impact him. And the fact that he can see me and my physical being, like I have a lot of melanin, it will allow him to be alert to things that might impact me. So when it comes to the fair treatment of someone, when it comes to treating another image bearer, um, according to the ways of scripture, no, I don't wanna treat him with partiality. And I can be aware of the fact that there are certain issues that impact white men. White men right now have the highest rates of suicide. Maybe I should check in with my brother. How you doing? You okay? You know, be, because I care for him because we share in the same body. We, we are in the body of Christ together. And so when I see Dr. Felder, I, I see that he's a black man. What are some things that may be impacting him um, within culture? And I, because I care for him, I want to be able to ask some of those questions. But when it comes to treatment, I'm not going to favor him or um, have some kind of different partiality or, or you know, favoritism toward him because of the color of his skin, but I am aware that there might be issues that impact him differently because of the color of his skin. So, C.S. Lewis said, um, you don't have a soul. You are a soul. You have a body. And so if you properly view the body that God gave you as the vessel that you are riding around in, like a, like a car you can't get out of, um, then that helps to bend your view of everybody else. And so... Um, is there a time where it's appropriate to see color? Uh, sure. There could be some things, as far as a teacher is concerned, that um, I might want to avoid saying because of some kind of cultural sensitivity. Um, on the other hand, I, I do wish we could dispense with the hyphenation of this country. Um, I'm an American. I'm a Wisconsinite. Uh, versus I'm an African American or a black Wisconsinite or, or, or whatever else like that. Um, and I have tried to do this. Uh, again, I've told you guys that I have, uh, I have an amazing pool of babysitters, my three little kids. And um, my wife has no idea if, like, w what nationality they are because I don't talk about them in terms of one of my black kids or one of my Mexican kids or one of my Hispanic or whatever it is. They're my kids. That's how I refer to them. And that's how I think it should be. And as far as the body of Christ is concerned, the, the beautiful thing about sitting up here is that I just got to meet three siblings. And, and, and when you have that oneness and you're in Christ, that's, that's how it is. Can we move on to the next question? <laughs> The, the next question also has to do with racial identity, but, but rather than thinking of how we perceive others and when we're colorblind or not, uh, this has to do with how we see ourselves and how we perceive others seeing us. And I'd like to pick up on something from over a century ago when W.E.B. Du Bois wrote about what he called double consciousness. And Du Bois meant that African Americans often experience this sort of two-ness as they go through the world or, or duality. They see themselves both as a member of their own African American community but then they also see themselves kind of projecting out as the white majority sees them. And so they, you know, they feel this, this awkward disparity between those two visions of themselves. And what I'd like to do is ask whether our panelists think that that's experienced today, whether they've experienced that. And, and whether, it, whether, you know, might a Latina experience that, not just an African-American like Du Bois said, or could a white male also experience that kind of tuness? Or I'm thinking of the end of your presentation, Josh. You spoke of identifying primarily as a Christian. Do Christians experience that sort of double consciousness in a society where increasingly we feel like minorities, where you have your identity as a Christian coming from your Christian congregation, and yet when you go out into society, you, you, you kind of second guess how others might be looking at you and, and whether you're comfortable having them know that you're a Christian. So again, W.E.B. Du Bois came up with that concept focused on African-American identity a century ago, but does that double consciousness apply more broadly? Is it helpful or not? Anna? Yeah, um, I would say yes. So 
it's funny because we had a conversation like this a while ago and you asked me, what do, I, what do you identify as? And at first I was like, well, I'm Latina, then I'm Cuban, now I'm Afri or Cuban American. And some people say, well, you're also half black, so you're um, Afro-Cuban. And so, so many things came to mind. And um, interestingly enough, the other day I'm having a conversation with a coworker and she's like, well, why do Cubans even come to the US? Isn't Cuba super awesome? And you know, we have free healthcare, free education and everything. And I'm like, whoa, like, have you heard of dictatorships? Like, have you heard of communism? And um, obviously this person didn't know that Cuba is a dictatorship. And so what I do now is that I use those disparities and differences um, as a way to educate others and just tell them, well, yes, there are good things, but there are also bad things. And if you're willing to learn, here's some knowledge. And so just to answer your question, yes, I think that sometimes I do feel like depending on the place I'm in, I'm like different people <laughs> in a way because sometimes I'm just an older sister, sometimes I'm a student, sometimes I'm Cuban, sometimes I'm American, um, but I've just learned to use it for the greater good. So, so in a world where <clears throat> you have every interaction between white and black, the ground rules are that there's some element of racism manifesting. Imagine if you would, being a white teacher in an all-black school of 240 students in an all-black neighborhood in the 53206 zip code. Um, I spent six years working at a school like that, and especially in the first three years, I had my motives questioned like on a weekly basis. And um, I had times where racial epithets were freely thrown in my direction. I was referred to as the 500 pound white gorilla in the room. And I was like, really, like, is that like a fat joke or what's happening here? Um, and so can a white person be a victim of racism? Well, yeah, absolutely. Um, I resonate much more with the second thing that you said though, where you feel uncomfortable to be a Christian. And I think that I would have to raise my hand and say I've been guilty of that more times than I care to admit. And of all the biblical heroes that I resonate with most, it would be um, probably Peter. Not bold Peter with the flame over his head at Pentecost, but cowardly Peter who denied the Lord because a 12-year-old little girl called him out. Um, and so I, I think about those conversations and how... Um, I need to have more courage to speak the truth in love because of my Christian consciousness. Gosh, um, I would say that when it comes down to the question of identity, who we are intrinsically at our core, at my core I am a child of God and that is I'm not in conflict with that. Now, does, like you said, like, you know, are there times when it's like, oh, you know, do I step in or, you know, do I, do I say something and things like that? I think we all struggle with that. But what I hear in the question is, is in Erin Du Bois's um, statement about double consciousness is about like maintaining two different identities. An identity is different than experience. And so I have an experience as a daughter. I am, I, I am a daughter, like that's, that's part of my, my living and, and upbringing. I am a daughter, I am a sister, I am a friend. And at the end of the day, my identity must remain grounded and firm in Jesus Christ, in who I am as a child of God. And so, I think, and, and I'm still kind of thinking this through, like what are the best ways to answer this and what, what do I truly believe? Today I can say that I truly believe that my identity, the core of who I am intrinsically is in the image of God, as a child of God, and yet I do have experiences that 
um, cause may cause me to, you know, when I'm with my mom, I'm not going to say everything that I would say when I'm with my friends, you know, but, but when I'm with this group of friends, maybe I, I understand because of some experiences that I've had that I can't really say, you know, all of that because that could be hurtful or we've had some conflict around that or, um, you know, this person wouldn't understand anything about that. So I talk to these people over here about those things. Um, it also makes me think about code switching, which is a term that um, black people use, or I don't know um, if other groups use it, but um, where it's like, you know, when I go to work, I have to talk white. And, you know, but when I'm at home, then I, I, I code switch. It's like, I can talk regular when I'm at home and I have to talk white when I am, you know, in the office. Well, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, it's like, well, when I'm in the office, I would put on a professional attitude and, and, and be professional. Why does professionalism have to be white? I would want to be professional because I want to keep a job because I like shoes. I mean, like, we, we have to kind of think about these things in a bit of a different way. So this is a question that I think sort of goes to the heart of the issue. Because I speak to a lot of black Christians. And from my perspective, one of the biggest problems is that they are blacks who happen to be Christians. They tack on Christianity to it like they would just tack on the day of the week or something. When the, Joy, when the George Floyd thing happened, I would get calls from people who want me to speak out and give things from a black perspective. And I would say, I can only give things from a Christian perspective because I'm a Christian who happens to be black. That is my worldview. That is where I'm grounded. I'm not a black person who has tacked on Christianity. So you can't ask me to give you a response that's, that's a black response because I'm going to give you a response that's a Christian response. You that's who I am. And I think that is what is part of the problem in the church today, is that people are giving responses based on their ethnicity, not their faith. Not, not their core identity, because I am a new creation in Christ. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. So when I look at myself now, I see a Christian who happens to be black, not a black person who happens to be Christian. There you go. Come on now. I was going to drop the mic, but you know, I didn't want to. You know. <laughs> and with that, I welcome the audience to join the conversation as well. Uh, feel free to approach the microphone and ask a question. And, and you may direct your question to all of them in general, or if you have a follow-up that goes to just one speaker, feel free to be specific. Uh, that, that's really up to you. This is your opportunity to follow up with, with anything you'd still like to learn today. Hello, everyone. Uh, so I have a question. I'm Congolese, by the way, and uh, I've been here for a year and a few months now. And I have a question. It's been on my mind for a long time. Um, don't you think, uh, I'll talk about racism. I don't like that subject, but I'll go with it. Don't you think the reason, okay, don't you think that we don't have the basis on love? Like for example, you can say that you love God if you don't love your neighbors, right? And that is one. For example, when I came in this country, I wasn't welcome the way I expected. Who cares? Nobody. But the question is, don't you think we should help people know love instead of making them understand what is love? Because they are making us understand that love is, you can kill for love, you can do this for love, you can do this for love, but I can ask, someone next to me who is not a colored person like me. Can you die for me? That person will say probably no. But God, he went on the cross for white, 
black, everybody, like the sir said, he loves diversity, he created diversity. But don't you think before going there, we should first teach people or tell people about real love? Like, if there's no love, there's no help, there's no white, there's no black, there is hate. So we need to show people some love before even telling them that racism, this and this and this and this. This is my concern. I had to get it, get it all out of my chest. So thank you. Thank you. When I answered that question last, last the last question I answered, I held on to the microphone. I should have got rid of it like a hot potato. But since I have the microphone, so, well, I heard, I once heard, I once heard someone say that people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. And I think that's at the heart of what you're getting to. The great thing about Christianity is Jesus. And Jesus is the ultimate example of love. Now, Christians may not always teach about love the way that they should. I'll be the first one to admit that. I'll be the first one to admit I don't because I tend to be an apologist and I tend to focus on these head things, but you are absolutely right. Love is a very important part of the Christian message. Matter of fact, the Christian message is love. It's, it's, it's God loving us so much that he gave his only begotten son. So as Christians, we should do a better job of talking about love, of, of, of showing love. And that starts with me. So now I guess I can hand this over to someone. Um, in, in listening to you speak, one of the, I had a couple questions. Um, you said when you arrived that, when you arrived here in the States, that you weren't received um, how you expected, and then you said, and who cares? And, well, I, I think I care, but I don't know if your experience is necessarily due to racism. You know, I think that we all have different experiences and if we don't stop and ask the question of, well, hey, you know, you said this or you did this, um, that, you know, we can necessarily equate that with racism. I don't know that you're equating it with racism. That was just the thought that came to me. I also would ask, um, what is the definition of love that we're looking at, that we're talking about? You know, we want to have a conversation on teaching people how to love and, you know, I, I do think I, I completely agree that Jesus um, is the embodiment of love. Like he, he shows us how to love. God is love. And as we have conversations on race and racism and all these things, and well, we need to love each other. Well, how are we defining love? Because that, I think, opens a lot of conversation or it can close a lot of conversations depending on what our answer to that is. Um, yeah, those are, those are just some of the thoughts that I had. If I have anything else, I'll share. Thank you for your question. And um, <clears throat> I'm sorry that that happened to you. And I think that um, some really good advice that I got when I was younger was you have two ears and one mouth and so you should listen twice as much as you speak. And so what, what I heard you say is that you've been hanging on to that for a long time and you wanted to get that off of your chest. And I think that um, something that I as a Christian fail to do is listen as much as I should. Um, and this is part of how I'm wired, like I'm a fixer. I fix cars and remodel houses and rebuild motorcycles and I do stuff with my hands. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a fixer. And so when my wife comes to me and tells me things that are problems, I have to stop her and say, okay, hang on a second. Is this, is this a me fixing this problem or a me listening to your problem? Um, gentlemen, take note of that because that's, that, that's some really good advice. Um, but I, I think we can show love by listening and the the other encouragement that kind of piggybacks off of what Oming just said is that um, I've heard that the number one source of conflict in any human relationship is unmet expectations. And so it sounds to me like 
your expectations were not met when you first got here. Whatever those were, um, you received something different. And um, I, did she say that was from racism or from? No, was I, just, I was wondering if that was um, part of the thought that maybe she thought that she wasn't well received because of issues of race or racism. And so okay. I was just saying. Okay. And so also figuring out like whenever I feel like I've been wronged, um, it's good to take a step back and say like, okay, what were my expectations of that situation? And um, were my expectations reasonable? Is there an objective thing that I can go and say like, hey, this, this didn't go well and, and we need to fix this. Um, and so those are, those are my thoughts on that. Um, I think that more than an answer, I kind of have a question. Um, and I'm, I'm going back to your um, conversation about love. And one thing that I often hear people say, so I have friends from all walks of life, right? Um, gay people, um, atheists, whatnot. And so one thing they often say is that they don't go to church because um, when they talk to a Christian, they say things like, I love you, I'm supposed to love you, but go get help. And so they see that as a problem. They don't see that as real love. But like go to church or go get help, things like that. And so I'm just wondering what's you guys' opinion on that? Like, is that love to tell someone, I love you, but you should go to church? Or I don't know, what are your thoughts? I think it's important to treat all people with dignity and respect. And um, I have uh, acquaintances who are gay and neighbors who are gay, and I have friends who are atheists, and um, friends who disagree with my worldview. And I intentionally try to keep them in my circle and help them and show them kindness so that there is a relationship there so that maybe someday God will give me an in to to be the conduit for the truth that person needs. If they're living outside of Christ, um, all I can do is get in the way if I, if, if I try to fix it. Um, but I think that, that showing kindness and not just saying, you know, go and get help, uh, that's, yeah, that's, that's not a, a path that I would want to take. Um, I would say that, Yes, I would, you, you definitely want to show love. You definitely want to respect the image bearer, the dignity, value, and worth of the individual, um, you know. And there is a truth and clarity in scripture. And so, like I've had a gay friend ask me, well, do you think I'm in sin? Because he grew up, you know, in the faith and things like that. Like, I, for me, I'm not saying this is y'all stand, but for me, I have to agree with the scriptures. Like I have to agree with the truth. And so I'm not, it, I, to me I think it would be unloving to lie to someone. It would be unloving to, um, to like caress their sin while they're going to hell. And that doesn't mean that I have to berate you. That doesn't mean that I have to, you know, you nothing but a worthless sinner and da da da, cause so am I. You know, I don't have to tell you to go away. I don't have to do any of that. I am a sinner as well. But I do think that we can speak the truth in love, and I do think that it would be um, unloving to know that someone is in sin, that someone is perhaps on their way to hell, and not share the truth. You don't have to receive the truth. You can tell me shut up, da 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 da. But I do think that there is a a way in which we can share truth respectfully, um, and then they can they can receive it or not or think about it. I'm not the one who has to you know get you all the way there, but I can share it. Yeah, I was gonna pretty much well say what you said, but what came to my mind when you asked that question was. Jesus and the woman caught in adultery. Because he said to her, he said, well, I don't condemn you, but he also said to her, go and sin no more. So Jesus called out her sin. He didn't just let her walk away thinking that she was okay and what she was doing, he called out her sin. He was loving to her, but he called out her sin. He let her know, this is not cool. Do not do it again. You know, 
repent. Sin no more. So that's good. I think um, that makes me think about um, John the Baptist. You know, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. It, it was. It's not about not telling, pe- calling people to repentance. It, that it, that isn't the thing. Um, now we can we can be a stand for love and share truth, but but going out Matthew twenty eight nineteen going out into all the nations, evangelism, um, the call to repentance. These are the foundations of us as disciples. So yeah, good question. In regard to those comments, I'm, I'm reminded also of something you said yesterday, Monique, in the classroom presentation, that our culture today has a big confusion. They've, they've confused righteousness with, with niceness, with being nice. And so I think both the speaker and the listener have the expectation that the conversation always has to go smoothly and everyone has to leave smiling. But sometimes hard conversations take place where people don't leave smiling, but then they go think about it and they come back to each other days or weeks later and continue the conversation. Or sometimes, you know, one plants and other waters, but it is God who makes to grow. And so you're not necessarily called to make others smile, but you are called to speak the truth and to do it patiently and lovingly, but not to be burdened by this expectation that it all has to end rosily in your own seeing. It might be someone else whom God sends into their life later who has the opportunity to reach them further than, than you were able to reach them. Uh, another question from the audience, please. And I see two of you going there, that's fine. You can just line up and if there's a third in a moment, feel free to do that too, okay? Thank you. Go ahead for the first of you. Okay, so this is kind of me continuing that conversation. So um, something that's hard for loving people and talking with them about sins that they openly have, uh, I gotta keep this vague. Last year, one of my best friends started transitioning and I tried having conversations with him about it. And it basically came down to the Christian view um, is against that. And the world invites you with open arms if you are transitioning. So no matter how nice you are talking to someone, no matter how loving you are, no matter how careful you are, it's so much easier for them to go to the open arms of the world because the world encourages them, the world invites them, and they have immediate friends, they have immediate support, versus it's a hard battle for them to continue being a Christian. And that's what ended up happening to them. They just went to the world. So do you have any advice on how to walk that fine line of not condemning and trying to make it easier for them to stay within the faith? Thank you for the question. Um, that is an incredibly painful reality about being in Christ is that um, people say, what's the hardest part about being a teacher in a high school? And I think they're gunning for the whole paycheck thing. It's like, wow, that's the worst part. No, it's the worst part about teaching in a high school is watching kids walk away. And um, I, I say I love my students. I really deeply enjoy talking to the 150 or so young people that I have come into my lab every year. And um, what is a good teacher if not a reader of people? And so you can see the ones who have turned and they're walking away. And there are times where I've reached out and you hit a brick wall or you get horrible backlash. Um, I think that the transgender issue is one of the most difficult things to talk about. And we, we try to be caring, and we, we don't really know how. And so um, one, one line of conversation I've had some, some success with, this is not a bomb-proof situation, but if you were to imagine a different mental health situation, because gender dysphoric disorder was a registered mental disorder like at Johns Hopkins up until seven or eight years ago. Um, and then the, the political machine got to them and forced them to turn over. Um, one of my uh, members of my family is a triage doctor, and he's not allowed to ask the gender of somebody, which is really important if you have a person coming with abdominal pain, like, 
are you pregnant is a, you know, versus not. So this causes all kinds of problems. But if you insert a different mental health issue there, like say anorexia nervosa or bulimia, okay, ask the question, how do I show kindness in the situation? So let's imagine um, a 16-year-old girl who is suffering from anorexia and bulimia. She's standing in front of a full-length floor mirror in her underwear. You look at her, and she's looking at herself, and you look at her, and you see every one of her ribs. You see her pelvis. You see her radius and ulna and her arms. She is objectively emaciated. When she looks in the mirror, what does she see? She sees a grotesquely obese person, and that's, that's her view of herself. Do you show her kindness by saying, yep, I agree with you, I'm going to confirm that, we should do a crash diet and liposuction? That, that's not going to help. And I think that the, the, the transgender issue is so difficult because people wrap up all of their hope in absolutely the wrong thing. And so you have this person who is told, they, they believe the lie, that if I just do all this stuff, if I just transition, if I just change, and I have this really invasive, expensive surgery, and I go through all this stuff, and I discard the identity God gave me, that once I transition, then finally all this pain that they have here is going to go away. And, and there's a ton of research coming out right now of people who have been detransitioning and writing about their severe regret. I forget what the hashtag is, but you can, you can look it up. Um, and a lot of times, they're not back to square one. They're actually way worse off because now they're broke, they're physically altered, and they have no hope. Whereas before, they're like, well, if I can just get here. Um, which is why I think that the, the rate of suicidality is exponentially higher than it is for um, people who are not suffering from that disorder. And so come at it from the position of, this person is going to hate me for saying this, but I have to speak the truth in love. Um, yes, the, the identity piece. Um, I think that, gosh, I think that, yes, it is easy for culture to embrace or the world to embrace people when they are transitioning and things like that because they don't understand truly um, the human and how we are designed. They don't understand it, but they also don't believe it. Um, and at times, calling people into God's design is for them. His, his true design for them is the most loving thing that we can do. It, it's more loving than allowing people to um, continue into a path of sin. Now, people will, like we, and I think it's also important to differentiate between like, am I struggling with the sin or am I fully unrepentant and in unrepentance? And your approaches to that are going to be different. Um, but, you know, thinking that, well, I'd, I want to love this person well. It, I think the, the verse is, um, it's the love of God that calls man to repentance. It, it, calling people to repentance, calling people to um, the truth of scripture is a very loving act, even when people don't want to, to understand or, or think of it as a loving act. I think part of the, the issue with that, though, is the redefinition of love, the redefinition of tolerance. A lot of these words that are being redefined and now used against Christians to say, well, now you're unloving because I've redefined this term. This is now what love is. This is now what tolerance is. And when you don't participate that way, as the Christian, you're now the oppressor. You are now intolerant. You are now unloving. But the truth of scripture hasn't changed. And so if the truth of scripture hasn't changed, then I must live in alignment with the truth of scripture. I don't think I got have much to add to that. Um, but I will say, I don't know if you were around for my talk, but I made a conscious decision to be an atheist because I wanted to do the things I wanted to do. I wanted to embrace the world and all the sin that the world had to give me. Nothing would have changed my mind because I wanted to do what I wanted to do. So just because 
it, sound, it sounded like you did the right things by talking to this person, by you know, sharing with the person uh, the gospel message, the love of Christ, and this person decided to turn away. Well, if this person decided to turn away, that's, that's not on you. We had people in the Church of Corinth, we had people in the New Testament who were turning away from God, and they were watching the, uh, the miracles of the apostles. You, we had people who, were, who, heard, who saw Jesus rise from the dead and they turned their back on him. So you can't put that weight on you if someone decides to turn away, because ultimately it's on them. Hi, um, my question is a little bit more vague, but I'm not really looking for a very specific answer. As Christians, we know that we are called to serve our vocations, and we strive to fulfill them within the structure that God has designed for our lives. You said now, we're called to serve whom, I'm sorry? What? I didn't hear the first part of your, you said as Christians we're called to serve. serve our, to fulfill our vocations within the structure God has designed for our lives. And it seems that a lot of the critical theories out there try to assert that all systems and all institutions are inherently evil because of the way they are designed. And I know, Monique, you talked a little bit about how there's not a lot of evidence that supports that claim. However, it's not entirely, without si it's not entirely outside the realm of possibility that certain in individuals could create systems potentially of oppression. My question is, I'd, I'd be curious to hear the panel's um, opinions or ideas on how we can honor the God-given systems and institutions placed in and around our lives while distinguishing them from systems or institutions that may not be God-pleasing. What, what was the last thing you said? That may not be what? God-pleasing. Okay. Okay, I'm trying to. Okay, could you say the question in one sentence? <laughs> I, I think I can repackage it. It okay. was, it was a, a very profound question, um, but let me see if I can simplify it. So, you know, God instituted marriage. The family is right. primary to, to everything else in society. So we're called, first of all, to be husbands and wives and sons and daughters and, and to serve our neighbor in that vocational context. But uh, also the church is established by God and civil government. Is, a chap is established by God with certain God-given responsibilities and those of us who serve in civil government have opportunities to love our neighbor in that context. Um, but then of course there are many man-made institutions and whether an institution is man-made or, or divinely established, it can be abused and misused. And so I think at the end you said, how do we, how do we distinguish between the proper use of a godly institution through which we can love our neighbor versus the, the hijacking or, or the redesigning of brand new phony institutions by which we pseudo love our neighbor. So the only answer I could possibly give to that is that is one of the reasons why we have scripture that allows us to be able to apply principles of scripture to our life to be able to judge other things by. That's the only standard we have. If we just pick stuff out of the air, you know, like, the atheist. If you're an atheist, then all things are permissible. But if you can make a good argument for it being or for it not being based on scripture, I think that's, I think that's your standard. I don't know. That's about all I got. Do you want to go? I'm, I'm still crafting something in my brain. I had to look something up. I cheated. Oh, it's on. Matthew 7.15. Uh, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. And so we're going to wrestle with systems being both blessings and also evil. They're blessings because God gives us systems to structure things that are more efficient and productive, and they're evil because, well, like, I'm part of them. And so uh, insofar as I'm a sinner, and all of the systems that are in the world are also made of other people who are also sinners, um, you're going to run into, like, I, I can't think of a system that is going to be automatically pure and not driven by at least one member of that system's desires to serve the self instead of serve what God says. But I would say, look at the fruit of that system and, 
and, and see if that is in line with what God says is right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, Um, I was just going to say super quick that as younger people, I, I see why that could be problematic just because just like there are good things that are made man-made, there's also bad things. And so in the end, just coming back to you, Josh, look at the fruits. Is it good? Is it bad? How are people interacting with it? And are they doing good things because of it or bad things? Just go from there, I would say. I think that it will be, at least for me, helpful. Um, and like, if we were to like have this conversation on the side, like, well, the, what systems are you talking about um, that you're seeing as good or that you're seeing as bad? And yes, I do agree that you know we as humans can make bad systems or participate in systems that are, you know, have negative impact on people. And we can participate in systems that, you know, have great impact on people. But it also depends on what your definition of good is. It depends on what your definition of righteousness is. I think what we're seeing today is the creation of some systems and then um, people trying to get rid of other systems and saying, well, this system is bad. But is that system truly bad? So this, I think yeah, you were right, like your comment, your question is kind of vague, but I think narrowing that question down and really thinking about it in a, um, in a very narrow way is important because when we hear things like you need to defund the police, well that's defunding a system and it's defunding a system based on lack of evidence but it's people's interpretation, their experience and now we need to create a new system, we need to create a new policy or you know things like that. So I would say yes, the fruit is important but then also looking at it um, from more of a well-defined viewpoint and saying, well, how am I defining a good system? How am I defining a system itself? Um, because I think you can see systems set up in scripture that are bad and systems that are set up that are good depending upon you know, how you define a system. Yes, I'd like to ask a follow-up question on, on that line of thought, um, narrowing again, as you suggested, to something specific as a case study. So, and I'm thinking of you as a student and Josh, you as a teacher, and, and both of you at schools that, that have broad ethnic diversity, including people from foreign countries as well as American diversity. And, and so I want to ask the question, what do you see as the patterns that make for success and the patterns that, that lead to struggle and what can students do? I'm thinking, you know, you're the president of the World Club. What do you see that students can do to help each other? And what do you see the teachers can do to help each other and to help their students so that we can wrestle through these problems together as a community? So Anna first and then Josh, please. That's a good question. Um, I think that one of the things I've found to be most helpful, both as a student and as someone who came from another country, is asking for help. The power in asking questions, asking for help, going to people who know more than you, that's huge. To me, that's huge. Whether it's for homework or a bigger thing, like a, a live project, just ask for help and seeking people who know more than you for one reason or another, to me, that has been the most helpful thing, if I'm being honest. So your question was, what systems breed success, is that accurate to say? Or what advice would I have for successful systems? Well, yeah, not even system, but just what we might call best practices or, okay. or vir virtuous conduct in terms of, you know, how do you as a teacher in that vocation love your student neighbor as yourself? And, and how do you guide your students in loving each other? And, and how do you as, with your faculty colleagues um, do that across what, the, what society would call ethnic barriers, mm -hmm. right, right? But how do we bridge that gap? As, as one humanity created by God and redeemed by the same God. In practical ways, how do you see that uh, helping your students succeed? So I've worked in several different types of schools. Um, I have worked in schools that said, we will take anybody, doesn't matter, and we're going to keep you here regardless of what you do. That does not work 
Because if you're in that particular environment, you cannot have a standard because the standard by definition has a bottom floor or a line you can't go over. Um, and the, what, what my school right now does is say, we will take anybody. We have like a lottery system coming in. Um, however, here are our expectations and here are our standards. And we will love you enough to hold you to those. We will help you when we're seeing you near the edge of that. And you need to understand that if you intentionally step over that edge, we will part ways very quickly. And what, what I, as a teacher of some v students who are in very, very difficult home situations, um, I have found, and this is advice to anybody who wants to go into the education field or other teachers, um, you, you can't, you, you, you must have accountability and standards. And the way that I have seen teachers, I don't want to say the word save because it's not the right word, but truly help kids who are on the fence to get off on the right side is, is through standards. Because if, if we lose a student because they made X, Y, and Z choice, whatever that was, and I have two other kids who are about to make that same choice, okay, I then have the ability to say like, here's the deal, if you do this, this is the consequence, you're gone. I love you balls in your court. And then I walk away and let them think about that. And then approach me again later and say, if you need help with anything, let me know. And eventually, people are going to make their choices. Um, but we, I think accountability and very, very clear standards um, that anybody can meet are, are what is critical for that very thing. Yes, thank you. And we do have time for one more question from the audience. Um, for my question, I wanted to come back to the second question that Dr. McPherson asked all of you uh, about color blindness. And it seemed to me at least that most of you erred on the side of uh, color blindness instead of recognizing differences between all of us. Um, and my question would be, isn't it, um, wouldn't it be beneficial, especially to the mission of Christians of loving your neighbor as you love yourself? to recognize the differences in what the past experiences and current experiences from different people and the way that we love them. So different people, they experience different things, right? And their past is different because of everything that's happened in the world. So like recognizing this difference, wouldn't it be beneficial to the way that we love our neighbor? Yeah, I think that's one of the things that I was saying is that I can be aware of someone's skin color, and yet I, I can do that because I can be aware of things that may impact them in culture as a human person, as an individual, but yet I am not going to treat them differently. I'm not going to, to um, treat black or white differently based on like things like racism or partiality. So that's where I'm saying, you know, no, I, I don't want to be, um, or yes, I do want to be colorblind in how I treat someone. I want to judge them off of their character, not off of their skin color. And yet I can still be aware that, you know, this has impacted this group or that has impacted that group or this has impacted the individual. See, I don't have to always associate it with a group. I can look at it based on the individual. And when we do it based on the individual, that also allows me the room to say, well, hey, this is impacting this person as an Asian American. I wonder, you know, I wonder if this person has been impacted as an Asian American because I see this maybe in larger media or things like that. Um, so, but I do, I really do think it's a both and. I think that yes, I can be colorblind. I should aspire not to judge people based on their skin color. And yet I can be aware that there might be something happening in culture or in my church that is impacting someone because of their ethnic background. Does that make sense? You know, I think, I think a close analogy can be also thinking about different ages of children. I, uh, my, my youngest is five months and my oldest just turned 16 and I do not assign them the same bedtime. So I treat them differently precisely to love them equally, right? And so like you said, if people are affected differently by things in the culture, then we have to reach out to them differently precisely to love them equally, right? 
Well, I want to thank you again for participating, you students, for your questions. And please join me now in thanking our panelists one more time. Our theme today has been to explore race, justice, mercy, and Jesus Christ, seeking a biblical worldview to address tough questions with true answers. And let's pause for a moment to review some recurring themes from today's conference. First, that we are all made in the image of God. Second, that we have all sinned, both against God and against each other. Third, we have one and the same Savior, Jesus Christ. That this Christian gospel is for people of every ethnicity that although there is much division and discord in society, there is a biblical path toward reconciliation centered on mutual forgiveness in Christ. I hope you recognize that these themes are not just something worth mentioning once in a while at a special conference like this, but that the church has always believed, taught, and confessed these things, and that it is both our privilege and yes, sometimes our challenge with God's help to live up to those commitments knowing that God made from one blood all the nations of the earth, that the promise of the Savior that God gave to Abraham was for all the families of the world, that Jesus not only sent forth his apostles to bring the gospel to the four corners of the earth, but that he also revealed to John what heaven looks like. Every nation, tribe, language, and people gathered around the throne of the Lamb, the Lamb who forgives them all. Long before valuing diversity and celebrating multiculturalism became political slogans in America, Christianity already was proclaiming, and Christians already were living out God's love for all people. The hymnals in the racks between your seats contain numerous songs that speak of race, the human race, and God's love for that one human race. It is within the treasured songs of the church, so squarely based as they are upon the Bible, that we will find healing, encouragement, and strength to live as those who have been loved by God, the one whose love transcends all understanding. And I have a few brief announcements now before you leave. First, I want the students to know that this conference came not from your tuition dollars. It came from generous donations to the center for apologetics and worldviews. And it's been my pleasure to serve as the director of that center these past couple of years and to bring this to your campus. Thank you all for coming. God bless.